Yeah, so we were talking about circuit complexity. We were talking about um, solving problems when you have this infinite family of circuits, one for each input length. And actually, from one circuit, say, Cn to Cn plus 1, those circuits could be completely unrelated. They could, it could be that for different input lengths, you have completely different circuits. Um, so we make no bounds on the computability of these circuits. Okay. So, so one thing I want to mention is that these kinds of questions about circuit complexity, say whether exponential time, two to the n time algorithms can be implemented with polynomial size circuits, they're interesting no matter how you resolve the question. So, so it was shown, for example, by Karp, Lipton, and Meyer that, for instance, if every algorithm running in two to the n time has one of these polynomial size circuit families, then, in fact, p different from np would follow. So, so if there were this very efficient way to solve exponential time problems by having this infinite computational model, you would resolve p versus np. And you can say something a bit stronger, in fact. If, if every problem solvable in, say, 2 to the order n time has circuits smaller than 1.99 to the n size, for implementing input links, p is different from np. So this is basically saying that if you manage to, by rigging up infinitely many circuits, get any tiny improvement over 2 to the order n, get 1.99 to the n in the size of your circuits, you will still have resolved p versus np. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if for whatever reason, um, exponential time is not in p poly, so there is some problem solvable in 2 to the n time that cannot be solved with these very efficient uh, circuit families, then in fact we would get pseudorandom generators of the kind I was uh, mentioning earlier. So it would mean that we have some generic method in general of taking a randomized algorithm, take, take any randomized algorithm, there is a deterministic procedure that will generate just deterministically some coin flips to make, just, okay, you flip heads here, tails here, heads here, tails here, and the algorithm will perform exactly the same. The randomized algorithm will perform exactly the same. Um, so, we in, so that would mean that uh, these sort of randomized complexity classes like BPP, RP, ZPP, if you've heard of these, these would all equal P. So this is the chief reason why it's believed by complexity theorists that randomness ultimately doesn't help in computation because we believe that exponential time is not in p-poly. Okay. Um, so in poly also and Vigderson showed just slightly more detail, if there is some problem in two to the order n time that needs circuits larger than 1.99 to the n size for almost all input links, then p equals bpp. So in other words, randomness in feasible computation is superfluous. You could always make it deterministic. Um, so I deliberately rigged these two hypotheses so that one is exactly the negation of the other. So no matter how this circuit complexity questions are resolved, we would get something very interesting. We would either have P different from NP, or we would have that P equals BPP, that randomized feasible computation is essentially deterministic feasible computation. Okay. Right, so. And in fact, this big open question of whether nx was in, is in p poly, if we could prove that nx was not in p poly, this would also lead to a certain kind of pseudorandom generator. Um, I don't want to go into detail about it, but basically there's a notion of pseudorandom generator for np problems as well. So you could imagine um, generalizing np to probabilistic polynomial time verifiers. So someone gives you a proof and you have a randomized algorithm which verifies uh, the, the proof in probabilistic polynomial time. If nx was not in p-poly, we could take such probabilistic verification algorithms and turn them into deterministic verification algorithms. So we could, uh, in complexity theory lingo, simulate Merlin-Arthur games, or MA, in this class NP, okay. and with, with certain restrictions. But, yeah. Okay, so, so that's uh, an overview of circuit complexity, a lower bound. So now I want to talk about uh, connections between them. So we have these algorithms for circuit analysis, which basically algorithm design problems based on things like satisfiability and circuit minimization. 
And we have these circuits for algorithms, in other words, circuit complexity, where we want to say, give some, given some complex algorithm, like an exponential time algorithm, we'd like to know if there are small circuits which can simulate them, these sm small circuit families which can simulate them. So, so these are two kinds of questions that complexity theorists were very, very interested in for a long time, and the kind of uh, things that we've been asking over the last few years is, can we use one of these tasks to inform the other task? So, more precisely, can interesting circuit analysis algorithms tell us something about the limitations of circuits? So, can algorithms for circuits tell us something about um, there being no circuits for algorithms? Or vice versa. Okay. So, in fact, um, there is um, some prior work on this. So, this theorem I was talking about of, of Karp Lipton earlier says suppose we had extremely efficient circuit analysis algorithms. Okay. Suppose circuit set were in polynomial time. Then we could prove that there are problems solvable in 2 to the n time that are not in this class P poly. So, if P equals NP, this, this says circuit sat is in P, circuit minimization is in P. We could get from this, in complexity theory lingo, there are problems in this class exp, exponential time, that are not in P poly. So from, in a sense, perfect circuit analysis algorithms, ones which run in polynomial time in the input, we can prove interesting circuit lower bounds. But I mean, this is an interesting conditional statement. However, it has limited utility to us because we don't believe the hypothesis, okay? False implies whatever you want, so we'd like to have some hypotheses which are true, or which we could hope to prove true, and see what sorts of circuit lower bounds are entailed from those. So, so P equals NP is all fine and good, but it's probably not true. So, so we'd like to, in order to prove circuit lower bounds, get something much, much weaker than P equals NP implying a circuit lower bound. Okay. So, um, so another case where uh, circuit analysis algorithms tell us something about limitations of circuits comes up in this natural proof barrier that I mentioned very briefly earlier. So I'll say a little bit about it here is uh, developed by Russ Borof and Rudic. So, so they, they say informally, suppose you have some proof and it's establishing a circuit lower bound and it constructs somewhere within it a polynomial time algorithm. And this polynomial time algorithm has the following nice properties. It can distinguish many functions that are not computable with your nice class of circuits from easy functions which are computable with your nice class of circuits. So, so a random function doesn't have small circuits and this polynomial time algorithm on a random function will say no, no small circuits um, with say decent probability. But for all those, uh, for that really tiny fraction of functions which actually have small circuits, it will say yes small circuits on those, okay? Suppose you get a polynomial time algorithm which does this, okay? This is a weak version of this circuit minimization problem, saying that circuit minimization is in P. Then, if you have such an algorithm, then your circuits are actually too weak to support modern cryptography. You can still use this to break a pseudorandom generator candidates because informally a pseudorandom generator candidate is supposed to be a very small object generating a long sequence which is supposed to look random to you. But if, if looking at this sequence, which is say the output of some Boolean function, you can distinguish small circuits, you know, sequences coming from small circuits from sequences which are random, then you have broken a pseudorandom generator at, very, at a very high level. So, um, so basically any proof that proceeds along these lines is almost certainly um, not going to resolve P versus NP um, because we believe in modern cryptography. So <laughs> either you dispense with modern cryptography or you, or you continue with your usual uh, line of proof. And uh, so, so unfortunately, almost all combinatorial arguments for proving strong circuit lower bounds, say super polynomial size lower bounds, they can be naturalized. You can extract from them a polynomial time algorithm which has precisely these kinds of properties which is showing you that pseudorandom generators cannot be implemented with these restricted circuit classes. But we believe they can be implemented in general. Um, and so we have to come up with proofs which do not include such properties. They somehow do not have such algorithms in them. Okay. Okay, so, so this is one 
way in which circuit analysis algorithms tell us something about limitations on our ability to prove limitations. <laughs> So another area that I'd like to just uh, briefly mention is uh, that of arithmetic complexity. So this is a, a, a somewhat different model. Um, so in arithmetic formulae, they're essentially analogous to Boolean formulas, except your operations are plus and times over the integers, instead of, say, or and 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 not over 0, 1. Okay? So you have some variables. They can be just, they could be any integers. And you're going to add some things. You can also subtract. You can multiply. And you'd like to know, uh, for what polynomials can I have small arithmetic formula, ones that don't use too many pluses and times operations. Okay. So, um, so a fundamental problem in this regime is a so-called polynomial identity testing problem. So given two arithmetic formulas, f and g, presented to you, uh, in whatever sense, this pluses and times over here and pluses and times over here, you want to know if they represent exactly the same polynomial. So you want to know if they're actually identical polynomials or not. Okay? And so this has a rich history of, in mathematics, and Euler constructed tons of these things in his spare time, like different identities between different uh, arithmetic expressions. So, so here's like one simple one. Okay? So these are exactly the same polynomial. And you, know, you, have, you have some x plus y times x plus y over here, and then you have x times x, y times y, plus two copies of x times y over here. These are two different formulae when you write them out, but they're identical. They're the same polynomial. And then you can, you can get increasingly more complicated expressions as you add in more variables. You can have strange cancellations of things in your identities. And, and um, so this is actually a very useful uh, problem uh, in certain uh, applications in practice, because sometimes in practice you can actually model the function you want to compute by a polynomial. So and then when you can test whether two polynomials are identical, you can really test whether this program over here is functioning how you would like it to, if you have some other polynomial over here representing what you want. So there are efficient randomized algorithms for this problem, but no efficient deterministic ones are known. And the randomized algorithm is actually really, really simple. The idea is that you just pick huge integers, ones much larger than, say, the maximum degree of the polynomial. So you just pick big, big integers. And you just pick them at random, and you plug them in on both sides of the left, left hand side and right hand side. And you check if the values are equal. Okay? If they're equal, you conclude with high probability that the identities are the same. If they're different, then you know that the two must be different polynomials if, you have, if the same input gave a different output. Nevertheless, so this is very, very simple. Just pick random values and plug them in both sides and see. Very, very simple, but there's no deterministic algorithms, uh, no. Like, essentially, like in the most general case, there's almost nothing. You know. Okay, so uh, Kabat-Zinn and Pagliazzo showed that, uh, in fact, developing efficient algorithms for this identity testing problem, which are deterministic, would lead, again, to a kind of lower bound. In this case, it was arithmetic formula size lower bounds. So, so basically, efficient algorithms for analyzing arithmetic formulas, determining whether two are identical, will imply limits on representing polynomials, explicit polynomials, with small formulas. So, I mean, this is the explicit statement of, of what it is, but you don't have to understand it. The main point is that, uh, trying to de-randomize polynomial identity testing, take it at randomized algorithm, which is very simple, make it deterministic, implies uh, lower bounds against what these formulas can express. Okay. okay, so another question you can ask is in the opposite direction is, can interesting circuit lower bounds tell us something about circuit analysis algorithms? Now, if we actually believe that lower bounds are harder, in some sense, than algorithms, then Intuitively, the proof of a lower bound should tell us so much more information about circuits that we ought to be able to get interesting analysis algorithms out of them. But nevertheless, there's much less known about this. Um, so for weak restricted classes of circuits, you can say, 
you can look at some old lower bound techniques which were used to prove these lower bounds and adapt them to get faster SAT algorithms. And pretty much all of the SAT algorithms I covered earlier uh, have this at their core. They, they were looking at the proof of an old lower bound and, and sort of re-rigged it to, to get a SAT algorithm. So just an example, uh, these Boolean De Morgan formulas over and or not with fan N2 so Subotovskaya showed in, in 61 that uh, the mod 2 function on n bits, so computing whether the sum of the n bits is, is even or odd, this cannot be computed with um, uh, essentially n of the 1.5 size Boolean formulas with n or not gates, okay? And then roughly 50 years later, Raul Santanam uh, found how to use her method, which is um, it's a very, very interesting method, but I won't start to talk about it here. But he showed how uh, to get this set algorithm for Boolean formulas using the same kind of ideas. So, so he was able to show that satisfiability of linear size Boolean formulas, again with n and or and, and not gates, can be solved in less than two to the n uh, using these ideas. Okay. So sometimes uh, when you open up the proof of a lower bound, you can get a circuit analysis algorithm. But in general, um, we, we really don't know much. So I'll just skip this for time. So, so what I really want to talk about is a new connection that we've recently found between circuit analysis algorithms and circuit lower bounds. So earlier we were saying if P equals NP, you can prove circuit lower bounds. So what we'd like to do is relax this condition so much that it's something we can see that could possibly be true. So the kind of thing we can show is that a slightly faster algorithm for a circuit satisfiability implies lower bounds against circuits solving problems in this class in exp, non-deterministic exponential time. Okay, so just in pictures, suppose um, this is just some arbitrary circuit of some polynomial size into the C, it has n inputs. Suppose we can in inspect this circuit in, in some way and find an input which makes the circuit print one. And let's say we do it not in two to the n times n to the c time, which is the cost of exhaustive search, but something slightly faster, like two to the n over n to the 10. So recall when we were looking at these uh, things like three sat and four sat, we had things like 1.3 to the n, 1.4 to the n, and so on. Here, we're, our algorithmic requirement is much, much weaker. It's just two to the n over some polynomial. So this is much, much weaker than 1.9 to the n. So it seems something, that's something that might be true. Nevertheless, when we can prove such a thing for, for uh, some class of circuits with various closure properties, we can say for that same class of circuits, there are functions in non-deterministic exponential time which cannot be computed with this class. So, so a slightly faster algorithm for circuit set, one running in even this time, would already imply in x not in p poly. And so now it's uh, a project to try to develop satisfiability algorithms which just barely beat exhaustive search. If you can do that, then you will have established these great results in circuit complexity that people thought were, were decades away. Okay? So, so what's some intuition for why this might be true? Um, so one intuition is that a faster circuit set algorithm is uncovering a weakness in representing computations with small circuits, right? If this circuit, if, I, if my algorithm didn't have uh, input, like true access to the circuit, if it just could access it as a black box, just query inputs and get outputs without looking inside the circuit, then in general it would take two to the n queries to figure out whether the circuit is uh, trivial or not. Right? You, could just, you could just keep saying zero until the final query where it says one. So the fact that I can beat this two to the n uh, black box access uh, lower bound means that somehow I'm opening up this circuit, I'm really analyzing it and understanding it in some way better than just querying a black box for uh, getting inputs and outputs. So somehow uh, when I presented this circuit, there's some weakness in, in this circuit can't hide satisfying inputs from me as well as a black box can. Okay, so that's one intuition. Another intuition is that when I have an algorithm which beats exhaustive search, I'm showing you here's an algorithm which runs slightly faster than to the n and is still solving this NP-hard problem. So in a sense, it's showing there's some strength in a particular 
algorithm running in less than exponential time. So I'm, I'm showing that polynomial sized circuits are, are weak and that these algorithms analyzing them are somehow strong, running faster than, than you would normally think. And, and we will hope to divide the two in some way and find some functions in, in X that aren't in P poly. Okay. And this connection um, sort of holds in many different settings. So, so if we have an algorithm for circuit set running in 2 to the n over n to the 10, for all fixed polynomial sizes, it runs in 2 to the n over n to the 10. This would imply nx not np poly. Now, suppose I had an algorithm for formula set. So we already saw that there are some improvements in formula set. But there's no algorithm which runs for all polynomial size formulas in 2 to the n over n to the 10. If we had such an algorithm, we would have established that nx is not in so-called nc1. So these are circuits of polynomial size, but they have order log n depth. There's only order log n layers to them. So it's some infinite circuit family, poly size, but order log n depth. Okay, so we would have lower bounds of that kind if we had a faster formula set algorithm. Okay, if we had an ACC set algorithm which ran slightly faster in exhaustive search, we would also be able to show that NX was not an ACC. And we don't require just satisfiability algorithms. It turns out that very weak derandomization problems will do. So suppose I give you a small circuit and I promise you that it's either unsatisfiable, so it's either the all zeros function, or at least half of its assignments are satisfying. So it has on n variables two to the, at least two to the n minus one satisfying assignments. Okay. You just want to determine which is the case. If you have randomness, this problem is very easy. You just try random inputs and with say after a small number of samples, you will hit a satisfying assignment with high probability. So with randomness, this problem is very easy to solve. But uh, if you remove randomness and just say, do it deterministically, do it in less than exhaustive search, all of a sudden we, we don't know what to do. Nevertheless, if you can solve this problem, we would still be able to conclude that NX was not in people. So, so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think ought, ought to be um, tractable one way or another. In, in fact, if, you, if given a formula, you could distinguish between these two cases, you would also have uh, the formula lower bounds, the NX is not in NC1. So, yeah, so I, I think these problems are, are somehow within striking distance. I mean, you just have to get a tiny improvement. So, yeah. Okay. And I guess the, the main point I want to emphasize is that we were actually able to find a faster ACC set algorithm, which led to this new lower bound that NX was not an ACC. And this was a lower bound which was open for a really, really long time. Now let me um, skip to that. So, so let's talk uh, more explicitly about ACC. So an ACC circuit family, it's, it's a restriction of, of P poly. It's again an infinite family where the nth circuit takes n bits of input and outputs a single bit. Again, the possible gates you can use in this circuit are n or not, and this mod m, which checks divisibility by m. So you can think of m as equal to 6 here. In fact, um, we were equally ignorant about the power of these circuits even when m is equal to 6. So you, you have n or not, and you're just checking divisibility by 6 of the sum of the inputs. Okay. And the main restriction is that the circuit has constant depth independent of n. So you can think of the depth as equal to 3. We were equally ignorant when the depth is equal to three. So again, here's a model of uh, such a circuit of depth three. So with three layers from input to output with uh, n inputs, size five, five gates, and, and depth three. Okay? So, so the complexity class ACC is the set of problems solvable with one of these infinite families of ACC circuits with the size being at most polynomial in N. And because you could always implement say, divisibility by six, uh, and, or not, all in polynomial size, this is a subset of P poly. You could always take such a circuit and make it just and or not circuit with, with polynomial size. And it's, this class is still quite powerful in some respects. It can still compute this undecidable language we were talking about earlier. And because there we only have to have either a trivial circuit or just the and of all input variables to already get an undecidable language. 
Um, nevertheless, they don't seem to be very powerful either. Uh, they can be efficiently simulated by constant layer neural networks. So, I mean, it doesn't seem that why would modular counting by six all of a sudden make things uh, very difficult? This was something that was, we didn't really understand. So where does this bizarre thing come from, this mod, mod six business? So it came from a particular approach to proving circuit lower bounds that was initiated in the late 70s. So the idea was we don't understand uh, Turing machines, uh, but we like to prove P different from NP. Nevertheless, we know that if NP is not NP poly, we can derive P different from NP. But NP not NP poly, this is just reasoning about graphs in a certain sense, reasoning about graphs with certain labels and or nots labeled on the nodes. And so they're very combinatorial, very, very easy to think about. And hopefully this would help us prove impossibility results better. Okay. So I tie in first sex and Sipser showed in the early 80s, inspired by this program, that the mod 2 function of n bits, so computing the parity of, of n bits, whether the sum is even or odd, is, is not in AC0, which as we saw earlier was poly size and or not, but constant depth. Okay. So, so you can't compute this mod 2 with and or not in constant depth, so you can't compute it in constant parallel time. So then it was natural to ask what happens if I give you the mod 2 function uh, for free as part of your operations. Then what can you do? So then Russ Balfman and Solinsky showed in the late 80s that if I give you mod 2 and or not in constant depth in your circuits, then you cannot compute mod 3. Okay? And in general, uh, for P and Q distinct primes, you cannot compute mod P, even given polynomial many copies of mod Qs and or not in constant depth. Okay, so then it was natural to ask, well, these are distinct primes. What if I give you mod three, mod two, and or not for free? What can you do then? So we'll suppose these are the gates you have to work with. And so Barrington in the late 80s suggested this is the next step. And he conjectured that the majority functional in bits, so computing the most popular bit, so which bit is more common, zero or one? He conjectured this is not in ACC. It makes sense. Somehow modular counting and constant depth somehow shouldn't work. But um, unfortunately, there was no progress made on this conjecture. And in the early 90s, it was conjectured that MP is not an ACC. So they were thinking maybe ACC is somewhat powerful, so maybe SAT is an ACC. We'll try to prove it it isn't. And okay, time passed, and this conjecture went unresolved. And then in the late 90s, it was said, okay, well, maybe ACC is just ridiculously powerful. Maybe this mod counting, mod six counting, uh, is super powerful. So maybe we can just try to show there are functions in non-deterministic exponential time that are not in ACC. And over the years, this just ballooned into uh, perhaps one of the most embarrassing open problems in complexity theory, um, which, which we finally resolved. Okay. So, so just to recall, a problem is an NX, but there's efficient algorithm for verifying exponentially long solutions. So just to give uh, the definition, so a problem is an NX if there's some polynomial time algorithm A in a constant K, such so that for all strings X, X is in uh, the language, if and only if there's an exponentially long Y, exponential on the length of X, so that this algorithm A, given X and Y, outputs one. So if you remember the definition of NP, this is basically the same definition, except in the definition of MP, Y is replaced by something, this is a polynomial in K. So you, you just take a log of this, and you'll get the definition of MP. So, but here we're allowed an exponentially long proof. Okay, some really, thing really, really long. And so an A is essentially running in time exponential in X, because it's time polynomial in the length of, of Y. So it's exponentially long solutions, exponential time. Very, very huge class. Okay. And the, the main theorem is that there's a problem in NX which does not have polynomial size ACC circuits, even when you allow a separate circuit for each input length. Okay. And just to try to understand where this sort of comes from, like why NX and not even bigger class, well, it was known that for bigger classes, uh, you can't have unrestricted polynomial size circuits. So for the so called NX to the NP, whatever that is, it's a bigger class. Um, we knew that you couldn't have polynomial size circuits for 30 plus years, but somehow uh, NX was this 
is this class where we still don't quite understand how it relates to theory complexity. Okay. So how does one get started in proving something which has been open for like this? So the idea is, is still very simple and basic and, and uh, at its heart, the idea is that we'd like to find some very nice property of ACC and try to turn this into a proof of a limitation of ACC. Okay. So, so we can try to get some inspiration from this thing called the non-deterministic time hierarchy, which in a nutshell, so you can read this or not, but in a nutshell it says, um, as you strictly increase the amount of time that you allow to solve problems, then there are strictly more problems that you can solve. Okay. So if I start with, if I'm allowed two to the n time to solve problems, say even non-deterministically, there's some problem I can solve in two to the n time that I cannot solve in, say, two to the n over n time. And, uh, and this is, sort of makes sense. Uh, it makes sense that as you expend more resources to solve problems, then there should be strictly more problems that you can solve. Um, but, yeah, so, so this is uh, just something from complexity theory. And the idea that we have is to try to show that um, if nx were an ACC, then this corollary, this sort of corollary can be contradicted. So how many people have seen things like the time hierarchy theorem before? So maybe half of you? Okay. So, so I, I can just try to motivate it a little bit. The, the basic idea is, um, the basic idea in these sort of diagonalization, these, these time hierarchy, Theorems is that you're going to try to construct a problem, so like or an algorithm that runs into the end time, and on all algorithms running into the end over end time, you're going to be able to say here's a particular input that on which these two algorithms differ. So you're going to construct a particular algorithm, say n running into the end time, that for all to the n over end time algorithms, say n sub i, we're going to be able to find some input x on which n and m sub i differ. And the way you do this in general is by some kind of simulation. So you have some generic way of, of just taking an arbitrary algorithm, m sub i, simulating it, getting an answer, and then flipping uh, whatever it says. So if it says accept, you say reject. If it says reject, you say accept. And so when you can do this kind of thing, it allows you to basically uh, say, no matter what algorithm you have, uh, they're running into the n over n time, this algorithm is going to differ from it on at least one input. And so it must be solving a different problem from all the other algorithms running into the n over n time. So, I mean, it's, it's a very similar uh, intuition from the proof that the halting problem is undecidable. Like this, in, in the proof that the halting problem is undecidable, you also have some kind of argument where you're simulating an arbitrary Turing machine and then flipping the outcome and doing the opposite. Okay. So in a sense, these sort of things follow from just taking the proofs that, uh, of undecidability results and scaling them down and adding time-bound resources to them. Okay. okay. So um, I'm not sure how much time I have. So I have like 10 minutes. Um, so I think I'll skip uh, the proof or even a sketch of the proof that faster circuit set implies circuit lower bounds. Um, if you look for my webpage, you can find proofs there. You can find sketches of proofs. You can find full proofs. You can find surveys. Um, so I think I will go directly to the ACC set algorithm because this is, I mean, this is something which is really intuitive and, and somewhat easy to get a handle on. Okay. So, so the main ingredients in this ACC set algorithm uh, there are just two ingredients, okay? One is a representation of ACC circuits that was known for a very long time uh, due to Yao and Beagle and Tauri. And so what they show is that every function that's implementable with ACC circuits can be decomposed in a very special way. So it can be written as a G of H's for some functions G and H. So this H is a multilinear polynomial with k monomials. So multilinear, meaning that it has no squared variables in it. So it's just a sum of some coefficient times a product of 
various products of variables. Okay, no, no squares. So you just take all different s possible subsets of variables, uh, you take their product, you multiply that by some coefficient, you sum all this up, this is a multilinear polynomial. Okay? And it has the property that over all zero one assignments to this polynomial, it will output some number between zero and, and k. And this k is not too large. So if the circuit size were something polynomial, it will be something, so if it's something like n to the k, it will be something like n to the log n. It will be quasi polynomial in the circuit size. The main property is that it's not exponential. It's not a huge polynomial. It's, it's something reasonable sized. Okay. And this, this function g, you can think of it as just some arbitrary lookup table. So it just takes a value between 0 and k and outputs a 0, 1 value. Okay, so when you compose this g and h, you can take some Boolean input, you get some Boolean output, and this is representing your ACC function. Some, some polynomial and then some small lookup table. Okay, so that's, that's one ingredient. And the second ingredient is just an algorithm that can quickly evaluate any such polynomial on all two to the n possible assignments. And it will do it much, much faster than the naive algorithm. So if you have some polynomial, just taken as a sum of monomials, suppose it has k monomials in it. The naive way to evaluate this thing on two to the n assignments would just be two to the n times k. Right? You just you just evaluate the thing on each of the k monomials, and you do it two to the n times, one for each assignment. But you can do much faster than that, and that's the key uh, to the faster SAT algorithm. Okay. In fact, it, it's the, the proof is very, very, very simple. Um, so the, the theorem is, so I, I like to show it because there, uh, the initial proof was like very, very complicated. And then it got somewhat complicated, and then it, it fits on a, a slide, and it's, it's really simple. So, so the theorem is, uh, suppose I give you a multilinear polynomial, and I present it to you just by telling you what the, all the coefficients in the monomials are. Okay? So this is some polynomial, and it's multilinear, so all of its monomials are just products of some variables, no squares. And so you can, they're at most two to the n coefficients, because they're at most two to the n, possible subsets of variables to the n possible monomials. So given this, these two to the n coefficients, we can compute the value of this polynomial on all 0, 1 points in 2 to the n times poly n time. Now this is interesting because if the thing were, had a representation of 2 to the n long, and you're trying to, to evaluate on 2 to the n points, you would think it would take 2 to the n times 2 to the n, 4 to the n. But in fact, you can do much better. You can get polynomial amortized time per assignment. You can get to the n times poly n. Okay? So it's, it's actually really simple. So the idea is that when you have any such polynomial like this, you can write it as uh, sort of two smaller polynomials, x1 times uh, a polynomial in just x2 through xn, plus another polynomial in just x2 through xn. So it's just dividing the pieces of the polynomial, those which involve, those monomials which involve x1 and those which don't. Okay. X, x1 is not squared in the polynomial, so this is actually a representation. Okay, so we want a 2 to the n table that contains the value of this polynomial and all 2 to the n points. So there's a very simple recursive algorithm for this. Okay. If the number of variables is 1, you just evaluate the polynomial on 0, evaluate on 1, output it. Otherwise, um, you have these two polynomials, h1 and h2. They're on n minus 1 variables. This is, these are still multilinear polynomials, so you can just recurse. You can compute the table t1 for the polynomial h1. You compute the table t2 for the polynomial h2. Okay? And I claim that once you have these two tables, you can manipulate them and get a table for the entire polynomial h. And the way you do it is as follows. When x1 is set to 0 here, then h equals h2, right? When x1 is 0, the, the first part vanishes, and h equals h2. So the first half of the table is identical to t2, the table for h2. Okay, so when x1 is 1, we want to do the second half of the table. When x1 is 1, the polynomial h just equals h1 plus h2, right? It's just the sum of h1 on x2 through xn, h2 through x2 through xn. 
Okay? So then what we do here is we take the, the table x1, the table x2, sum them component-wise, and concatenate that to the end of t1. Okay? And this gives us a table for all values where x1 is 0, all values where x1 uh, is 1, and recursively it gives us a value on all the other assignments as well. Okay? So it's, it's really that simple. Just a, a simple divide and conquer. Okay? And if you think about the, the recurrence, it's, it's just a standard kind of recurrence uh, that comes up, say, in, in sorting algorithms. Um, we're making two calls, and we're dividing the size of the output we want by two. And we have some 2 to the n times poly n overhead in merging the tables. Um, so just looking at the recurrence, I mean, it's something like, if you think of this 2 to the n as something like m, then it's, your recurrence will be something like m log m. Okay. So, so as a corollary, uh, given this g of h's, you can compute g of h on all points in 0, 1 of the n, and only 2 to the n times poly n time, regardless of how large uh, the polynomial h was. Okay. Okay, so now I'll show how the SAT algorithm works. Um, suppose you have a, a ACC circuit, and let's just say it's of size 2 to the n the epsilon. So think of epsilon as really, really small. You could even think of it as polynomial size. Okay. Just think of this as a, a small circuit you want to compute satisfiability for. Okay. So this algorithm, if you've seen SAT algorithms before, uh, they're not going to help you because this algorithm is very, very different. Um, so the next step that we do is uh, you take the first n to the epsilon inputs of this circuit, where epsilon is, again, the small parameter. You take the first n of the epsilon inputs, you try all possible 2 to the n of the epsilon values to, this, to these circuits, you stick them in a different copy of the circuit. So you have different copies for each of the possible 2 to the n of the epsilon assignments. And you take the or of all these things. Okay? So, so you're basically brute forcing SAT on the first n of the epsilon inputs, plugging in, getting a different copy of the circuit, and taking the or of this huge thing. Okay? So what does this give us? It gives us a much bigger circuit, but nevertheless, the number of inputs has reduced. It's gone from n inputs to n minus n of the epsilon inputs, because essentially we brute forced the first n of the epsilon inputs. So they're, they're no longer there. We just tried all possible assignments to them, got a different copy, and took a big or. So the main observation to make here is that if this is an ACC circuit, then this is also an ACC circuit. We increase the depth by one, but ACCs are ors have ORs in them too, so it's still ACC. The second observation is that if this circuit is satisfiable, if this has an input which makes the circuit print one, then this is also satisfiable. This also has an input which makes the circuit print one. And in fact, it's an if and only if. If you have a satisfying assignment here, you can get one here. Okay? This is, so like if you had an assignment that sets the first in the epsilon inputs to all zeros, then you look for the copy here that has all zeros, plugged in the first in the epsilon. You plug in the rest of the assignment here, this thing would print one, and so the whole or would print one. Okay? So, so you've preserved satisfiability of this uh, circuit, but you've reduced the number of inputs. Okay? Now, the next thing we do is we apply this decomposition. We apply this thing which takes any ACC circuit and decomposes it into this G of H, this lookup table of this multilinear polynomial. And in pictures, it looks something like this. So it's a, so it's a quasi-polynomial time thing. So it, it, it takes two to the n the epsilon and makes it look like this. This is some multilinear polynomial. You can think of it as just a bunch of different ands. Okay? You're summing up all these different ands of variables. And you have some lookup table that will compute an answer based on the sum. Okay. Now, now you apply the fast evaluation algorithm to this object. Okay? You're, so this thing is, has a polynomial in only n minus n of the epsilon variables. So when you apply to this object, you, you still get that you can evaluate the polynomial on all of its possible assignments in polynomial amortized time, but now you have something running in faster than 2 to the n time. So the idea is you just evaluate this object, this g of h, on all possible assignments in faster than 2 to the n time, and then you just check if it ever outputs 1. If it outputs one, the original thing is satisfiable. If it, if it always outputs zero, the, the original thing is unsatisfying. Okay. 
so, um, so that's the, the set algorithm. And um, so are there any questions about it? I'll jump right to the conclusions, and I won't hold you any longer because I'm getting hungry too. No, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll jump to the conclusion. Thank you. All right, so, so what about future progress? So what we'd like to do is replace this huge class NX with simpler complexity classes. Ultimately, we'd like to show that, say, polynomial time is not in ACC, for example. Um, but in order to do that, so there's some trade-off between the circuit analysis algorithms that we are looking at and the kinds of lower bounds that we can prove. So intuitively, it means that we should have to improve on exhaustive search for more complicated circuit analysis problems. So, so here's one kind of open problem. Suppose you can not only solve satisfiability, but you can count the number of satisfying assignments. Does this imply stronger lower bounds than things like NX, not NP poly? Um, because I, actually I have algorithms which can count satisfying assignments to ACC circuits, but I don't know what lower bounds they imply, if anything. So it, is it basically the same algorithm? Or it no, it's a bit different. It uses a different decomposition that was proved by other people. You use a, rather than an or, you use, a different, you use a different kinds of symmetric functions to sort of extract bits of the count. But there's a different decomposition of ACC, not by, but by later guys. Yeah, but, but at, beyond that, it's the same. <laughs> yeah, that, that's only different. So another obvious thing to do is to try to replace ACC with a uh, stronger circuit. And this is where I think a talented student could just come in and make some progress because you don't really need to know about the prior work. You just have to, do, to try to find set algorithms that beat exhaustive search for formulas, uh, for circuits, for any interesting uh, class. Okay. Um, or you could e even just try to distinguish between the case where a circuit is totally unsatisfiable, all zeros, or half its assignments are satisfied. Okay. So just a concrete open problem. Can Boolean formulas of size S be evaluated on all possible to the n assignments in polynomial on S plus to the n times poly n time? Right? Naively, just exhaustive search would take to the n times poly S, but we like to separate these two. If you can do this, then you would have a, a breakthrough in, in formula size lower bounds. Okay. And in, in general, as you've seen, there are lots of connections here. And uh, I hope we can find more. Thanks. <laughs>